instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Do you notice that? That he's saying that there'll come a time when people aren't going to put up with sound doctrine, with right thinking about God. That they're going to gather around them people who say what they want to hear. I think we all have that tendency to only pay attention to people who are saying what we want to hear. We've got to be careful. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, writes this. Now, the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their consciences are dead. You notice it said some will turn away from the true faith. There is a true faith. There is a false faith. Not all spiritual claims are equally valid. We've got to pay attention to what we're absorbing. Not every message that's floating around about God is accurate. In Hebrews chapter 13, the writer of Hebrews encourages us, says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. So the theology, the understanding of God that we have matters. There's something at stake here. So we've got to be careful that we don't just absorb our understanding of God, that we not merely absorb our theology. We must intentionally theologize. Intentional theology is what happens when we carefully consider and question the theology we've absorbed. Intentional theology. To consider it, to question it. Now, obviously, we should question what we hear about God from outside Christian circles, from the world, so to speak. But this even applies to the theology we've absorbed in growing up in the church, for those of us who grew up in church. We need to question these things. We need to ask, okay, do I really believe this? And if I really believe this, why do I believe this? In other words, we, we own our faith. I remember in the, the church that I grew up in, uh, going to Sunday school, the youth group there, I remember one of our Sunday school teachers said on several occasions, she taught us, you know, it's not right to question God. And even as a teenager, I'm sitting there going, I'd like to question that statement. I have problems with that. We've got a Bible full of people questioning God. Job is the poster child of questioning God. And God didn't strike him dead. God seems to like it. As a matter of fact, throughout Scripture, God seems to like it when people kick their brains into gear and seek Him and reach out after Him. And what that requires is questioning. Do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe it? One of the most often quoted passages here at Berea Baptist, it works its way into probably every second or third sermon I preach, <laughs> is when a fellow walked up to Jesus and asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, Jesus said, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your what? With all your mind? This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus said we must love God with all that we are, even with our minds. God gave us brains, and He does expect us to actually break down and use the things every once in a while. And He expects us to do that in our study with Him. People talk about blind faith. I don't think God wants anybody to have blind, ignorant faith. I think God wants us to have intelligent, informed faith. Now, it's still faith. It's not science. It's not something you can examine in a laboratory and uh, have the same result under rep uh, uh, controlled conditions. <laughs> That's not the type of stuff we're talking about. It's still faith. 
And it's not blind. At least it shouldn't be. Love God with our minds. Do you love God with your mind? The study that you engage in about God, your, your effort to understand God, does that reflect a real love for God, a passion for God, a hunger and thirst for knowing Him on a deeper and deeper level? Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 22? That's the chapter I just quoted from. Matthew 22, page 699 in the Pew Bible. Now, the quote that I just gave you about Jesus said, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What we're about to read is a conversation that Jesus had just before that. And he has a conversation with a group of people called the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, uh, that was part of the, uh, in the Jewish society of that time, that was part of the ruling religious elite. These are highly educated people. These are uh, well-practiced theologians. Now, the Sadducees, they belonged to a flow of thought that had some peculiar beliefs. One of their beliefs was that there was no such thing as a resurrection. They believed that when you died, that was it. There's no heaven, there's no hell, you just hit the grave and you're just gone. You're dead. They also didn't believe in things like angels, demons. So here they're having this conversation with Jesus. And what they're going to do, they set up this hypothetical situation to try and prove the absurdity of life after death, the absurdity of resurrection. Listen to this exchange. This is Matthew 22, beginning verse 23. That same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, came to Jesus, with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, <laughs> people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. He reminds them, you've not read Scripture closely enough. In your own Scriptures, it says, God says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, not I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, the implication is that God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though they died physically, somewhere they're still worshiping God. And Jesus points that out to them. Jesus questioned their theology. Now, in our culture, you're not supposed to question people's theology. Boy, Jesus did. He questions their theology. The Sadducees were in error, Jesus said, because they did not know the Scriptures or the power of God. That's what Jesus told them. You just don't know the Scriptures. You don't know the power of God. Their understanding of God's Word was too limited. And their conception of God was too small. They didn't know the power of God. The, the idea of God that they had was of a weaker, smaller God. Let me ask you this. How big is your understanding of God? How big is the God that you worship? 